Right, before we get going and uh, I, I hand over to, to Heidi, uh, let, let me just uh, say that uh, uh, I saw a few great posters in the poster session just now and hope everyone uh, joins tomorrow morning uh, to see more posters there. Uh, there's, there's a great choice available, uh, so please make use of that. And uh, over to you, Heidi, and to the speakers of the BSM session. Okay, we'll give them a people another 30 seconds to join us. Okay, well, in the interest of time, uh, hello, I'm Heidi Shellman, Oregon State University, and I am going to be chairing this session on Beyond the Standard Model Physics. Uh, the ground rules are that it's a 25-minute talk with five minutes for questions. Uh, people can ask questions uh, either in the chat or by raising their hands, and uh, that, that's how we're going to do it. Um, it's possible to interrupt, but probably not a good idea to do it too often. Uh, so just launching into it, our first speaker is Peter Everett from uh, the University of Wisconsin. And he's gonna be talking about high PT searches for BSM physics on behalf of the large LHC collaborations. Yeah. Hi, thanks a lot. Yeah, so I'll be talking yeah, about uh, uh, BSM searches from the Atlas and the CMS collaboration. Um, so give me a second. So, okay, the LSG was really built as a discovery machine where we really hoped to find uh, hints of beyond the center model physics. And we're still hoping to do that. I mean, both in direct searches as well as in measurements of which we already heard some of it actually have some deviations in measurements and so. And so this actually has led to an ever expanding portfolio of beyond the center model searches. So at the right, I give like, you know, one of these plots, which was actually shown before the LSG started of different ideas where we could search for. And now we're actually already filling up a lot of these not yet thought of things that we're actually even searching for uh, new models, which we weren't uh, considering back then either. And so we try to drive our program actually by as well theory as like results from other experiments. So, you know, like, of course we want to solve some of the big problems that we know exist with the standard model, like, you know, what is dark matter, dark energy, uh, the Higgs boson mass calculation, why does it become infinite, uh, matter, antimatter, asymmetry, things like that. Uh, while we also take into account these hints from measurements like the cosmological constraints, the direct searches for dark matter, uh, muon G minus two, like we heard about, and also within the experiments, like standard model measurements. And so a lot of the BSM program is actually driven by signatures. And I hope to actually point that out that in a lot of cases, basically our triggering and our reconstruction algorithms are really crucial because we have to be able to discriminate between our signals and our backgrounds. And in some cases, the differences are quite small. And so as a result, we are continuously optimizing this by improving the techniques to lead to like, you know, sometimes even new uh, decay modes that we could actually target and sometimes just more sensitivity. And so if you look at the BSM landscape at the LHC, there's actually a very impressive list of models being covered. You have uh, searches for new fermions, for new bosons, for new interactions. There's lots of different searches. And just to give you an idea here, you see at the right, like, you know, one of the summary plots from Atlas, but uh, you actually have five or six of such plots before you cover all of the BSM searches which are being done. And so I can only show a small subset when I've focused mostly on the most recent results from the last six to nine months. Um, a lot of the searches will actually use, uh, you know, new techniques and uh, a lot of it is based on machine learning. For example, you know, like a lot of the boosted objects are being reconstructed in uh, the LHC and there's a lot of improvement there. For example, at the bottom right, you can see, you know, this is a new kind of algorithm which looks at the individual particles in a, in a top quark jet as like, you know, parts of a cloud and then tries to do the reconstruction. And so these boosted objects really, you know, open the whole new field. And we'll also hear about this in the dark matter talk tomorrow by Federico. Um, we also have to go into very soft decay products, which I will also show in some cases that, you know, like to really close all the gaps, we need to be able to do that. And also there we really need some new techniques and machine learning to go further. 
Okay, it's the same with long lived scenarios. And then sometimes we even use it for background estimates. And so, so I will try to give some highlights from different parts of the program. And I would actually like to start with supersymmetry, which is still one of the most popular uh, beyond the standard model theories because it serves many of the open questions. So like the dark matter question, the hierarchy problem and things like that. And it does that by basically giving every standard model particle it's Suzy partner, like you can see on the top. So a boson gets a fermion and vice versa. Uh, so this gives you a very, very wide variety of signatures, which can be targeted uh, with all kinds of searches. And so we've done this and now she has actually put very serious constraints on it, but you know, we keep on exploring new face space. And I'll try to point that out by, you know, like trying to target more challenging signatures as well as going beyond vanilla Suzy. So we're starting to look into the next to minimal supersymmetric model into R parity violating more and all these things will help to, you know, give us new signatures. And so we keep on expanding on our previous um, exclusions and I will actually focus on a few new results here. And those will be mostly electroweak Suzy results. And okay, so like every, like you probably know, uh, the strong production of supersymmetry has larger cross sections, as you can see in the right. And so the electroweak SUSY particles have actually not been explored to of the same masses. And in some cases, we're really still constrained by, you know, uh, the amount of particles we can produce, like the statistical uncertainties. And so as a result, you know, like it actually um, is quite interesting still to look further for this. Um, so on the next slide. Yeah, so one thing I thought was uh, is quite interesting is the fact that, you know, like we have these searches for Trajinos and Neutralinos, which are the fermionic superpartners of the WZ and Higgs bosons. And historically, they were always targeted at the LSG through the leptonic decays, because it was always thought that, you know, like these are very nice, clean leptonic signatures. This is the way to go after them. But, you know, because we've made so much evolution and basically understanding jets and jet substructure, nowadays, this is not fully the case anymore. And so at the right, you can, for example, see a new search from CMS on the Higgs Higgs plus MET final state where, you know, basically the both Higgses are produced, are reconstructed as fat jets. And those are the two X's. So those are the two uh, jet masses. And so then it's split into zero, one, and two uh, Higgs bosons. So, you know, you, you have the different uh, tagging rates actually in there. And th you can actually see that, okay, by tagging more and more, uh, the data points, okay, here you can already see the outcome from the search because the data points get less and less. And, you know, your signal would be quite visible here in actually this mass corner. Um, one thing which actually shows us very nicely how much uh, progress we have from these uh, hadrang searches is the plot on the bottom left, where, you know, you basically show the exclusion of the Chargino mass, at the x-axis, versus the lightest supersymmetric particle on the y-axis. And the red curve here are basically new hadronic searches. So this is a plot from the Atlas collaboration. And so you can see that the new uh, hadronic searches basically really push the limits at you know, the high uh, Chargino lasses much more than uh, in the past. And okay, like, you know, the more compressed scenarios are still targeted mostly by leptons, but you know, like you can really see how the hadronic part starts playing a very important role. Um, I already said that, you know, the more compressed scenarios are better, uh, easier to approach with the leptons. And so a very special case there is basically also looking for Higgsinos, which is quite interesting scenario um, where, you know, like we hope, I mean, we expect that the Higgsinos are very close to each other in masses. And so the decays will only give very soft standard model particles. So, you know, this is not so easy for the LSG to target. And so we, uh, we have to, you know, get this rather challenging experimental signature still visible. And so here at the bottom right, we basically show how we do this. We do this by giving a strong push basically to these particles, giving them a strong boost by, you know, requiring a significant amount of initial state radiation, because when they get pushed, their momentum will increase and they become visible in our detector. At the same time, for this new iteration, both CMS and Atlas really worked on, you know, lowering the limits on the momentum and stuff that they could probe. And so, you know, because of that, they were go able to go lower and lower into mass splitting. And so here you can see that, you know, they can go down to mass splittings up to like around 2 GeV at this moment. So this becomes quite interesting. 
Um, at the same time, in these kind of scenarios, if your mass plane gets too small, your particles also become long lived. And so you can see that here with the yellow band, which actually comes from the long lived scenarios. And one of the challenges now is basically to close the gap between both and really go after this. And, you know, we're working on that. Uh, and there are some ideas about how to do this. Um, I also wanted to show one new search for um, which from the CMS collaboration, where basically, you know, you're trying to look for light Higgs bosons, but starting from SUSY uh, scenarios. So you're starting from a cascade decay from squarks and gluinos, which go down to basically uh, Higgs bosons, which are lighter than a standard model Higgs boson, and which will decay into two bottom quarks. And so the way you try to do this is then you look at the uh, masses of these two jet particles, uh, of the two fat jets, which would correspond to your two candidates for this light Higgs boson. And so we require that those two masses are basically equal uh, and this will give you the main region. And then, you know, like you'll have two sidebands where the masses are different and those will be used to basically predict your background. And so here, you know, basically they considered a gluino pair, squark pair and gluino squark production together, which is why their mass limits go quite far out to almost 2,600 GeV. Um, a second set of theories, which is being looked at quite actively on the LHC, are basically the, um, the, are the vector-like quarks. So those are colored spin half fermions, uh, which have, uh, compared to the standard model quarks, basically the, the, uh, that their left and right-handed components basically transform under the same way under gauge transformations. And so they can mix then with the standard model quarks to regulate the Higgs mass and solve the problem of the Higgs mass calculation. And so this is, primarily important for the third generation. And so in these searches, you'll see that we both have single and pair production possible. So the pair production is in some way the universal mode, because at that moment, you only dep uh, it only depends on basically the mass of the vector-like quark uh, that determines your production cross-section. The single production in principle can get to higher masses, but everything depends on basically how it's coupled with the standard model. And so the standard model coupling will play a much bigger role in that case. And so there's a new search here from Atlas where they're looking for T quarks decaying to a top and a Higgs boson. And so um, in that scenario for the T quarks above one GeV, they have mostly single production, uh, of course, depending on what you consider for um, the standard model couplings. And so, uh, but, you know, the double production would not be large enough in this case to basically go after it. And so we um, reconstruct the Higgs in the top core, uh, quark as a large radius jets. Um, and that's, you know, that's the way we try to gather them. And then we look at the mass of the Higgs in the top quark here at the bottom right. And so you can see then that, you know, like you would see this red axis above like the major backgrounds to basically see evidence of this particle this moment, we don't see any evidence. Uh, we actually then also split it between, you know, like top tagged, anti top tagged regions, Higgs tagged, anti Higgs tagged regions, and also in different BJET uh, regions to allow for like, you know, uh, normalization regions, validation regions, and then your final signal regions. And so here at the bottom left, you can then see, you know, which uh, masses you're actually targeting for different couplings uh, to the standard model. And so, you know, like you can go out to around two TeV or even a bit higher, um, depending on the masses and on the couplings to the standard model. Okay, um, there's also in many of the standard model theories, uh, new heavy resonances, which would be predicted. For example, in two HDM models, you have extensions of the standard model Higgs sector, which can be um, spin zero uh, particles, like scalar particles or so. You also have an extra dimension theory, spin two gravitons and spin zero radions. You can also go into the NMSSM or so, and you'll have it as well. Um, and yeah, of, or new vector bosons, like you can see at the bottom left and the uh, Feynman diagram here. Um, so the CMS collaboration has this new search, which uses a new like, you know, jet uh, substructure tool, this particle net uh, to basically look for extra scalars. So basically this one is looking for um, a scalar X, which is being produced and then would decay to a standard model Higgs boson and another scalar Y, and both of those would predominantly go 
into BB bar. And so uh, the dagger used here is this particle net, which sees the jets as a kind of particle cloud. So it tries to get the information from these particles like that. And it's actually much more performant than uh, our previous dagger. And you can actually see this in a little bit from the results. Because okay, then they do actually a bump hunt and a 2D mass plane uh, for this mass of this X particle and the Y particle. And so you can see here, for example, the example from the Y particle and what they would expect to see. And if you then look at the limits, um, if you take the limits for the Y particle being equal to the Higgs boson, then it's basically the same scenario as this X, X particle going to two Higgs bosons. And actually, you know, there was a recent CMS result uh, targeting that final state. And this search actually does a factor two almost better than that in this exact scenario, uh, thanks to these new tools which are actually being used. So that's actually quite interesting to see how to go after this. The scenario with uh, the X going to two Higgs bosons is also targeted by ATLAS in multiple final states. And so ATLAS actually recently also uh, gave, uh, made public this combination of searches actually going after this, which looks actually both for resonant production of Higgs boson pairs and non-resonant production in like, you know, all these different final states. And what is actually interesting, if you look at the exclusion plot here at the bottom left, is that, you know, depending on where you are in the mass range of your X particle, you will see that, you know, different channels start mattering more and more. So like for the lowest mass, the BB gamma gamma is uh, very important. Uh, then there's a region where the BB tau tau becomes the most crucial. And at the end, it's the 4B. And okay, this search was also a little bit interesting because it uh, actually has an excess of around three sigma locally. Okay, it's a small excess. It's not anything to get very excited about, but you know, it's always nice uh, to have a few excesses to keep an eye on in the future. Um, similarly, you can actually have such a um, extended Higgs sector with like an X uh, particle, which would then decay to also lighter Higgs bosons like these A particles. And so that's actually a search which is then being done by CMS, which then actually looks for these light Higgs bosons instead. And again, this search is actually done in the 4B final state and it uses information as like, you know, how far are these two away from each other in pseudo rapidity and also the double B tagging to basically discriminate and also to then make regions to estimate the major backgrounds. And then in the end, you also look at, uh, you try to get to the mass of this A particle as well as the X particle by doing some proxies. So, you know, like you use the average jet mass from these fat jets to be roughly this A particle mass. And then the die jet mass from these two will give you the X mass. And so you can see that distribution here. And you can see here that, you know, you can really target a variety of masses actually with this uh, search. Finally, another interesting, uh, model which is being searched at are the leptoquarks, which are hypothetical quarks, which couple both the leptons and quarks. Uh, you can have both scalar and vector bosons here. And what is very interesting here is that processes including these leptoquarks could actually violate lepton flavor universality. And so they've gotten very popular because they can give a possible explanation for the B anomalies. And so these kind of particles are predicted in all kinds of new physics models like guts and composite Higgs models. And, you know, like then the final decay of these particles will be in here, for example, an up quark and a electron neutrino or in a, a bottom quark and a tau. So there's all kinds of, uh, you know, it's always going into a lepton and a quark. And so both CMS and Atlas basically have um, a, a wide variety of searches going after this. And I just give a few highlights here. So, you know, like there's a bunch of dedicated searches as well as reinterpretations from uh, existing results. And, you know, Atlas and CMS try to go after the different generations as well as scalar and vector lepton quark models. So you can see, for example, here, this was one going after the first generator scalar lepton quark. Here it's a third generation vector lepton quark, the third generation scalar. And so you have a little bit of everything here. And so some of these plots, like, you know, here, for example, this one from CMS shows also where, you know, the B anomalies would actually prefer us to be, and then shows the limits as a corresponding to this. 
And okay, here at the bottom, you also can see that there's like, you know, a combination of different searches, which is being done in Atlas. And so here you can see that, you know, these two, the brown and the orange are basically um, dedicated searches, while then the purple one is then a reinterpretation from an existing supersymmetry search, which actually also has sensitivity to this model. And you can see the complementarity actually between, you know, like this wide set of searches and even searches which were not intended for this can sometimes really uh, contribute to this. Um, another search from Atlas, which is quite interesting and can actually also target possibly leptoquarks or other models like RPV Susie is actually looking at the charge asymmetry in EMU events. So the idea here is that, you know, we know that in the standard model, there's processes which have a charge asymmetry. For example, um, the W boson production as a charge asymmetry. And so it could also be that there's charge asymmetry coming from basically adding uh, new physics. And so in this case, they try to look in E mu events to the ratio of E plus mu minus over, the ratio, over E minus mu plus. And in the standard model, this is expected to be around one, but you know it could deviate from one if there's actually new physics, like, like one of these. And so this search basically has uh, different search regions to target the R parity violation SUSY and the leptoquarks, and it's trying to target both of them. And okay, then you know they can set limits. Uh, uh, this is, for example, a result from the R parity violating search, where they look at the small mass versus the lightest supersymmetric particle mass for different uh, couplings, uh, R parity violating couplings. And so you can see basically how the range would change depending on what your real couplings would be. Uh, another search in the AMU final state is basically for lepton flavor uh, violation. So uh, we know that it exists in the neutrino sector, but has not in, uh, been observed in the charged uh, leptons. So, you know, as a result, if we would see a large amount of charged lepton flavor violation, it would indicate beyond the standard model of physics. And so this analysis basically tries to target uh, a Z boson decaying to an electron and a muon. And it uses for this basically a boosted decision tree, which is strained in uh, the leading jet PT, the missing transverse momentum, and also the momentum of the uh, EMU pair. And so you can see at the right top, basically, you know, the distribution of the boosted decision tree. And then, you know, you basically look at the uh, electron muon mass here at the bottom to basically see whether you see uh, any peak around the Z mass peak. And um, the constraints from this are even improved a little bit by, you know, using uh, the ratio versus like observed EE and mu mu events to reduce as much as possible the systematic uncertainties. And so it gives this uh, direct constraint oh. of three to 10 to the minus seven, which is around a factor 10 better than, you know, the lab constraints. Uh, it's of course still considerably lower than the indirect searches, but, you know, in that case, uh, you do have more assumptions which go in um, so this is a bit different. And okay, also in the Z to L tau, Atlas has a very interesting result, which is linked here in case people are interested in looking at it. Um, then uh, lepton flavor violating Z prime actually could also be targeted in basically a bunch of final states. Also again, E mu, E tau and mu tau. And so um, such a search can also have sensitivity to quantum black holes and R parity violating SUSY. And so CMS does such a search and basically tries to get rid also of like, you know, misidentified taus by requiring an MT requirement. And then it's basically for the uh, eta muta final state it reconstructs the mass using a collinear mass uh, approximation. And okay, in the bottom left, you can actually see for the EMU then uh, how the mass distribution would look and how you would see the signal above the background. There's no indication, so limits can be set. And so for a lepton flavor violating C prime, the limits are almost at five TeV, uh, as you can see here. And finally, there's also a relatively new results from CMS, which is a more generic search, uh, which is a more broad uh, multi-lepton search, like, you know, uh, like both experiments have had quite a lot in the past, but such a search could basically target a lot of different models. And so this one has seven distinct channels based on the number of light leptons and hadronic tau that they have. And, you know, like, so it tries to do actually two things. It tries to first have a model independent selection 
which instead of looking at how your signal would look, looks at how your major backgrounds look. So for example, okay, if you look at the, the WZ background, which is important for trileptons, then you know it's, uh, it's on Z, it has a relatively low transverse mass. So you can use, I, well, it has a transverse mass around where you would expect the peak from a W. I mean, so you can use that kind of information. And so they try to create bins based on these standard molecular characteristics of their backgrounds. And then at the same time, they also create a more model independence, model dependence search, which basically, you know, they use a few specific models like type three seesaw fermions, vector like leptons and leptoquarks. And, you know, they train a BDT basically to these models. And these distributions are, for example, from one of the BDTs trained for the vector like leptons. And so this actually tries to then go very specifically and push the limits a little bit further but you know, like only for these specific models. So you pay the price of not being as generic anymore. Okay, so um, to conclude, uh, I hoped that I was able to show that the direct searches for new physics at the LSG are a thriving field and that we keep on increasing our sensitivity due to improving techniques and adding new uh, decay channels and everything. So that at this moment, we're going well beyond what we thought was ever possible uh, before the LHC started. In some cases, you know, we added new channels like the Oladronic channels I showed for Chargino neutralinos, which we didn't think would actually have any sensitivity. But, you know, thanks to our new techniques, we're actually able to do this and push our limits further and actually probe further and further. There's also some new models which have been are still being explored for the first time, but sadly enough, I don't have any evidence to report for beyond the standard model physics yet. But nevertheless, we're still learning by excluding more and more model phase space and really, you know, understanding which kind of models we are not seeing and where we can keep on looking. So um, there's a lot of work still left for these searches in the future. What is actually very interesting at this moment is that we're actually getting a lot of interesting hits of where to look for new physics with like the flip to, uh, with the B anomalies and the muon G minus two results that we hopefully even can target a little bit more so that we really get even more of an idea of, you know, what kind of new physics could be out there. Uh, theorists keep on coming up with new uh, signal models. We uh, are developing more targeted searches to really go after some of these very difficult scenarios which we haven't, and some of these gaps which we haven't been able to close. We'll get more and more data as well in run three as the HLHC. And we're improving our detector and trigger capabilities already at this moment. For run three, we will have quite a few improvements. And then of course, even more for the HLHC. And this will really also allow us to go after these challenging uh, signatures and come up with new ideas about what we can all do. Thank you very much. And uh, if there's any questions, please ask. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Uh, yes, we do have time for a couple of questions. So uh, people can try raising their hands uh, in the, and I can call on you. Got to see, ah, Tanya has raised her hand. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. Can you go to slide 11, mm -hmm. please? Sorry. Ah, my slides are... Flipping back okay. And yeah, okay. So I'm wondering, because you're mentioning here that uh, the search of you in the 125, 125 uh, region is actually better than the dedicated uh, yeah. search, as far as I understand, uh, yes. for dihex. So my question is, what uh, will happen now? I mean, will the results from this search be then taken into account in a, an updated combination, or, or how, how does it work? Because, I mean, you didn't show them, but there are, or maybe you showed them, I missed it. But there are always this combination plots, you know, for heavy resonance going to 225s. And yeah. as far as I understand now, many groups in both Atlas and CMS are working on scenarios like uh, the one which is shown here, where, of course, this will always be part of this, let's say, asymmetric final state search. So... And I assume that sometimes the, the results will also be better, like in this uh, scenario. So yeah. what, what is the strategy? <clears throat> I mean, um, I cannot, well, 
I cannot, I would expect that this, uh, this will be included, but I have not actually discussed it with uh, responsibles for these results. But I, I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's a natural thing that, you know, like if you have a new result which supersedes your old result, you'll try to use that in a combination. I think that's the natural way to approach. And it's yeah. really also because we're learning. I mean, we're learning how to use our detector even better, which is why, you know, like these limits are even stronger. So yeah. as a result, I mean, we should just use the new results. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We have time for one more question. And actually Marco has that, gets that question. Yeah. Th thanks very much for the, for the great talk. Uh, and I have a question on the same topic uh, that you mentioned the factor two improvement that, that you get, um, how much more space to, to improve is there uh, with, with, with uh, further uh, techniques. We've, we've heard earlier from, from uh, Gregory as well, that, that there's a lot of work going on, um, but for, for this particular case, for example, what, what, what do you expect going forward? Oh, that's a, that's a hard question. So in this particular case, I think we're, you know, like, well, it's, of course, we're getting, uh, the, the possible gain gets smaller and smaller because, you know, we're already using here the top of the art now of like, you know, uh, a neural network here that we have so you know like as a result i think okay there can be still some improvement but i wouldn't expect another factor of two improvement right. but i think for many other searches and stuff we're not yet there i mean there's places where we're still using older techniques and so and so i do think that you know there's quite a few places where we can gain a lot more but i don't think this particular one i think you know like at some point yes you do start hitting uh, the limits okay thank you Okay, well, thank you very much for this excellent talk. Um, I would like to move on to our next speaker, who is uh, Federico Le Leo uh, Reddy from CERN. And could he please put his slides up? Yes. Can you see them? Got it. Yep, we can see your slides. You're in present presenter mute view, so you might need to yeah. switch. Yeah, got it. Okay. Okay, and then I can maybe also... Yes. Put, uh, and once again, the rules are 25 minutes. You'll get a notation at the top telling you of the timing. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, I'll try to move one thing out of the way if you can just bear with me. Yes. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. So uh, today we've seen a lot of physics and uh, unfortunately or fortunately, I have a lot of physics myself. So let's get uh, cracking with the slides. A very brief introduction. So as you can see, the talk is about long lived particle searches. So again, direct searches, but focusing more on this uh, trend to have a look for something which is uh, doesn't like to interact with the standard model as much as some other signatures. So in these introductory slides, I put this plot on the top, uh, top right of the screen that hopefully shows us that we are indeed facing a two-dimensional problem. And although we have seen, for example, in the last talks, a very interesting new results about pushing the energy scale, searching for direct, direct signature of beyond the standard model physics, there is also an interaction strength problem that can be explored. And this can, can be done with existing experiments and with new experiments. And in this talk, I will try to give a brief summary of uh, what has happened in the last couple of months uh, in the, essentially this field. So what do I call uh, as what do I define as long lived particles? So I'm an experimentalist personally, uh, and I put here the plot that you see on the top right, which really shows that indeed, when we say displaced particles are particles that don't like to couple with the standard model much, but actually even standard model particles can have, if you want, displaced signatures. There are quite a lot of them, in fact. And so that's probably why also with the existing uh, uh, detectors, which were not designed specifically to study for displaced signatures of physics beyond the standard model, we can, we can actually be very competitive. Um, this is, in fact, the definition that I'm using for beyond the standard model particle and, 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 uh, and, and displaced particles. So all this work, everything that you see that I will present in today really comes out of an amazing community that is growing and growing over time. This is actually, you will see it in my talk, like there is a lot of, of of fast pacing, in fact, about these searches. And it's all based 
uh, not all based, but all is presented uh, twice a year in a, in a workshop which gathers uh, the community together, if you want, and everybody can be part of this community. Uh, I, I put here on the top right the plethora of new experiments that we might be facing, as presented by Matthew in the last workshop. Uh, now, there is also uh, a newly dedicated um, working group of the LAC Physics um, a physics center about the LAC long lived particles uh, related experiments and theory, which is uh, highlighted here in red. Anyway, just to say the community is, is big, is getting bigger, and the momentum is growing. So I will start now with uh, um, the experiments which are already built and running, which were designed to study something else, probably, <laughs> but that can do amazingly well also for these type of searches. So we will do CMS Atlas with new results, both of them LACB. CMS. Very nice plot, just quickly here to show you that indeed there are a plethora of results from the CMS experiment. Click on the reference. All my reference boards are clickable, by the way. All my references are clickable, by the way. So click on the reference if you want to, to study these in more details. Um, now, there is a new result from, uh, from CMS, and I will be only flashing it here because there is a dedicated talk, I believe, on Wednesday about this. So please do connect to that talk. This is a study using 2016 and 18 data for long-lived particles that came to a pair of muons. We will see something similar to for the LH LHCB experiment later on. The experimental signature, you can see it on the right, uh, right hand side, is essentially, okay, a displaced of uh, a display, an isolated displacement of pair of muons. What can this be? Well, okay, we can have uh, some models that can give uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this, uh, this result. For example, uh, an HA, uh, um, a hidden abelian Higgs model. You can see it on the, on the, on the top right here with the dark, two dark photons and then the dark photon decaying to to a pair of muons, um, uh, or you can have other uh, other other uh, models where you have the exotic heavy neutral scalar boson X, which is decaying to a pair of muons. Uh, no excess was found, um, and I I put here at the bottom uh, just one example, one, one one plot for one example of one specific scenario. But again, new result uh, just came out, I believe now. So if you want to learn more, connect to the talk on uh, on Wednesday. Um, so another result, which is fairly recent from CMS, which I highlighted here uh, for, for so all of this is, of course, it's just my personal selection, but this result is extremely interesting, I believe, for the approach they had of an extremely model independent way of performing this analysis where they have no requirement for common vertex of displaced particles, large transverse impact parameter is used. You can see it here on the, uh, on the kinematic on the top right here. Uh, and therefore using this, you can heavily suppress the standard model background. And you select events with two displaced and anti-isolated leptons. You use the fairly familiar ABCD method to perform this search and you find no excess in data. Uh, you can use this to, to place some limits on, on some models. But what is very interesting in this search is that it, it performed in a really model independent way, which allows then theorists, of course, to take the result and put the limits on the model that they prefer. But anyway, CMS has done it for us, for two, um, okay, quite popular, I would say, models, a lightest SUSY particle, uh, which uh, you, you can see here on the, on the right hand side. Um, uh, uh, sorry, on the on the bottom, uh, or for example, here you have a, lo a long leaf scalar on the right hand side, and the and the and the limits that you can see here. By the way, these two plots are different. Eh? One is uh, one is light uses to B, and one light uses to D. Again, very competitive results from from CMS. Another uh, cherry picked analysis, if you want, from CMS, which I personally appre appreciate, um, is the search for long uh, right handed sterile heavy neutral leptons. Now, this is a super popular um, theory um, where you can you know this displaced. Uh, um, uh, displaced uh, neutrinos and can be Dirac, can be Majorana, can be both, in fact, um, and they interact with the standard model, but not very much, therefore they're quite displaced. In this search, it's very nice to see these decays of studies to only WL or Z nu, and you have the, therefore this reconstruction in the final state of only three leptons, if you want, and here you have the combination. It's very nice to see this combination of prompt lepton heavily used in the trigger and displaced leptons pairs coming out. Now, uh, doing this, 
allows, okay, the CMS um, uh, collaboration to place some extremely competitive results, even in region of phase space where you would not believe CMS to be that competitive. Uh, so, okay, on the top right, you see the, the, the categorized selection of events uh, using the invariant mass and the transverse displacement. Okay, this is uh, nothing new, but what seems uh, to me um, extremely impressive is the great result that you see here for regions if you look at the mass of, 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 the, of the neutrino here and the plotum at the bot, which are quite low indeed, actually, uh, you are almost go getting close to the charm threshold. These, the, these two plots are coupling for the muons and coupling to the electrons. But again, very impressive results from, uh, from CMS, which has done amazingly well here. Um, again, the reference uh, is clickable. Now, Atlas is no less. Uh, here, again, a plethora of interesting results. Um, that, that you can click and, and study further if you want. This is just to give an eye the impression of how much stuff CMS and Atlas are able to put out every year. And again, a super new result. So thanks actually for the collaboration. Louise is one of the conveners that actually provided me with this slide uh, because otherwise I would not be able in fact to probably prepare it myself. This is a search for displaced dark photon jet, is a search for, lo for light long lived neutral particles. You can see here on the, it's quite crowded but there, are, there is a lot of information. So if you want go back to this, but I, I just gonna flash here the type of, uh, of Feynman diagrams that we're looking at with the coupling here of the dark photon here expresses gamma D, so differently from the CMS analysis, and two type of decays that you're looking at, a monic decay and a calorimeter decay with different experimental challenges. Uh, what's interesting, I think, as a takeaway message, surely is the output of the neural network uh, uh, based tagger, uh, indeed quite impressive to see this result uh, uh, from, this, from this experiment. And again, the type of limit that the ATLAS uh, collaboration is able to place, um, again, for quite a low uh, dark photon mass, if you consider the, 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 the mass, the phase space that, 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 that we're looking here. Indeed, extremely competitive, I believe, and is um, uh, it's it, essentially looking at new topologies, and that's what allowed for an exclusion of, of, of a drawing the case in this case. More in a talk and in a poster. Okay, moving on to another Atlas result, which I found quite interesting, uh, is fairly new and is a search for events with a pair of displaced vertices from long lived uh, neutral particles, and they're decaying to hadronic jets. Uh, okay, so this is the type of Feynman diagrams that we're looking at. Uh, and essentially in this search, you have a, a pair of displaced vertices. And this is why I, I, I picked this analysis. It looks very interesting to me that Atlas is able to use the pair of displaced vertices in their signatures. When actually a lot of the time, LACB and even CMS are just discarding one of them uh, because otherwise you would have not enough sensitivity. But Atlas, on the other hand, is able to do this. To do this, I, I, they, they, for example, they use a dedicated trigger with this uh, muonic spectrometer cluster with the requiring some signature for the muons. And you can see here on the bottom right. And again, a dedicated vertexing algorithm. So um, the, the nitty gritty detail of, the, of this equation, which I've stolen from Audrey's talk here, uh, is quite interesting because uh, some of the of, 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 of the of the orders that were added to this equation were essentially zero in the past, but now you can, if you want, we are performing a next to leading order analysis. Um, the, the main background is punched through QCD, but this is uh, uh, kept well under control, and the limits that are set are shown here on the top right. Uh, this time as a function of the proper lifetime, and you can see different examples of different mass in different colors. Again, Quite interesting to see this use of, of, uh, of two uh, displaced vertices. Um, another result which I, which I place here, which I find quite interesting, uh, is the search for an exotic Higgs decays to, to long lived particles. You will see something similar also in, a, in, a Higgs, in an LACB search. But here, what you have uh, is, a, is essentially, um, uh, um, yes, as you see here, uh, uh, basically four Bs, exotic particles producing four Bs. And you take advantage of the associated production to probe medium decay length. 
And you do that and you triggering on the, on the prompt they produce left on the, you can see here on the top right. Now um, you have essentially two displaced vertices, once again in the, in the detector. And okay, uh, this is something new, which I've never seen before. One variable that is used to select signal from background is the number of tracks per event. That's fine. And another one is what they call here a reduced mass variable. It took me a while to understand what it is. Uh, essentially, here they're plotting, the, okay, they define delta R as the angular separation between the momentum of a track that you go to remove and the remaining track's combined momentum, okay? You take this away, uh, and what you do is you then plot, you then pick the maximum value for delta R, and then you take a ratio of the, essentially the recombined mass over this delta R max. And you can really see the effect here is quite prominent peak, which you can use to then cut and discriminate signal from background. Very interesting. I probably need more time to fully understand this type of, this, this definition of a new variable. But what you what you're able to do by using this, this this variable and probing this phase space is essentially putting a limit in a place where before you had no limit. If you if you if you look at the plot here at the bottom right, again as a function of the proper lifetime, you can see these lifetimes were essentially unexplored by the Atlas uh, experiment in the past. Okay, now I move to LACB. Uh, and I ask myself a question before I do so. So here, usually you will get the slides describing the LSB experiment is a four spectrometer, blah, blah, blah. But maybe you know about this already, or okay, maybe you can just read it. It's, it's, it's easy to understand. Maybe what I want to put here is that actually, if you go and look at the magnetic field of the CMS and the LACB detector, although they look so different on paper, Actually, maybe the, 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 the distance that they can probe is not that different. And you can see these uh, in the results that are coming up, if you remember what I've just uh, shown for CMS. This, of course, is not detrimental to the fact that it makes a lot of sense for ICB to be the shape that it is, if you look at the plot on the, on the right here. Um, so I present here uh, an almost a new result, which was presented once which is a search for massively long-lived particles decaying semi-leptonically. Quite similar here, you can have essentially dark Higgs probing these type of things. Um, the, the mass rate that you probe is, uh, is, is very similar if you look uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the mass uh, that, that the CMS is probing, very interesting. Um, and the lifetimes as well are quite comparable. What I put here on the bottom right is quite unique to LACB is when you go and plot data versus, uh, versus, uh, versus background, uh, a signal versus background, you can see the effect of a unique uh, thing that is, I believe LACB is doing, which is to veto for regions of possible material interaction. You can really see here in effect. Anyway, the search uh, is giving you no access, uh, therefore the limits are placed. And you can see here the examples on the right when you do the total fit of background plus signal. And indeed you can see a good agreement between, between, uh, be between, between data and, 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 uh, and, your, and your total fit. And therefore the customary Brazilian plots here on the, on the left hand side for an updated result for, for LACB on this, which is quite interesting. Uh, another uh, result from LACB, which is a bit, a, bit, a bit longer, is this Higgs to LLP to jet pairs. Why do I put here a, a result which is based on run one data set, the only result based on runway data set in my, in, my plot, in my talk, is because of this plot on the right hand side. Okay, apologies to the CMS and Atlas collaboration. These two limits have now been proved by two collaboration, but when the plot was produced at the time, it was quite nice to see this serendipity, if you want, complementarity of results between the three experiments. But actually, you can see what I was saying before about LACB and CMS actually probing a similar, if you want, um, proper lifetime. Uh, LACB can also search for dark photons. And here is probably where we are, if you want, more competitive than probably in other places. I put here uh, some slides to, to, to explain the result, but essentially maybe one takeaway point that you can have here is that in the LACB search, the A prime, so the, the dark photon, this is the th third different way of describing a dark photon in my talk, but you see different experiments use different terminology. 
uh, inherits the production mode mechanism from a gamma star, from a, from a standard model uh, gamma star. Therefore, you can normalize it to signature. And before in this analysis, you essentially have no use of Monte Carlo. You have no systematic for Monte Carlo. This is a truly data-driven analysis. Quite interesting, I believe, this, uh, this thing. Um, now, uh, you can probe different regions of displacement, but no excess is found. And you can do this search in a, um, in a model dependent or a model independent way. And I put here the results from the model independent paper. You can see the references changing on the top right. And you can, you can put some nice results here on LCB. Of course, it would be very interesting to see what LCB can do with RAN3, which essentially as LCB will have a, essentially a new detector, especially the removal of the hardware trigger will indeed, I believe, uh, give LCB a good boost here. Now, for the last part of my talk, uh, the last couple of minutes, I will want to flesh the plethora of smaller experiments, which are, uh, if you want, uh, starting to appear around these big experiments that I've ever talked about. So I have a collection here of experiments which are proposed and which were proposed and are now underway to be built or are in fact uh, even being commissioned. So let's first begin with Anubis. So for the experiments which are not founded, I will put the explanation of the name in the slide. Anubis is a very, I must say, one of, one of the coolest idea I've seen in, in a while. So Anubis, you take the shaft of Atlas or CMS for it, um, which is essentially a news theory data taking, and you instrument the shaft in one way. Here, there are three different ways of doing it. And by doing that, you essentially create a, a, a newly, a new dedicated long leaf particle detectors with essentially zero civil engineering cost, which if you look at Sheep or Methuselah, it, it's, a big, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big problem right now. And you can put, you know, very interesting limits compared to other experiments uh, for a fraction of the cost. Okay, Methuselah is another essentially a, a new detector proposed to be built on top of the Atlas uh, detector, essentially is an IKEA building here, almost underground, but not really, which essentially is looking for displaced particles, like really displaced particles. It's a really big, you can see here the dimensions, but I'm happy to see uh, that very lately, Mathuda is implementing an impressive amount of work related to simulation, which really proves what they will be able to do in the future. Phaser, on the other hand, is an experiment which is fully founded and is going to be built, is actually being commissioned right now, and it's going to work in run three. Extremely uh, exciting time, I must say. It, the position is shown at the bottom, and the detector is shown on the, on, the, on the top right. Essentially, you will look for displaced particles produced at the Atlas interaction point. Uh, and you have a lot of matter to essentially shield you from all the background that you might see. So much that you're actually able to even build a neutrino detector. As you can see, phaser new, again, the money are there, it will be built. Uh, you will be able to probe a very interesting, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, phase space studying neutrino using a mansion. And the, the limits that phaser can put are very competitive, if you can see here, and essentially is unexplored phase space. Phaser will not be alone using a new space near Atlas because SND LAC is another fully founded detector. Extremely interesting moment, of course, to see this happening on the opposite side of the Atlas, uh, of the Atlas uh, cavern. Uh, this detector will uh, mainly be uh, concentrating on uh, neutrinos. You can see here again a plot which shows the unexplored phase space that uh, SND will be able to cover. This is a detail of the experiment. Just one point here, because it's a bit different from what we've seen in the past. This experiment is using a lot of emulsion and essentially is a combination of an offline and an online detector. And here you have a wafer essentially of scintillating fibers and emulsion working together to give an extremely impressive, uh, if you want, um, re time resolution and space resolution. 
what can you do with SND? Well, you can do amazing neutrino physics. Okay, fair enough. But I'm not here to tell, tell you about this. I'm here to tell you about displaced signatures. And even for displaced signatures, SND, even if it's a bit unconventional, if you want in shape, can, be, can do quite well. If you, if, you, if you look, for example, to these examples for leptophobic portal or dark photons, uh, SND is quite interesting in what, in what it, it, uh, it, it can achieve. Um, in the in, uh, during run um, the last two experiments I'm going to talk about are about are about uh, milli charged particles. Again, these these experiments are founded. Milli can is a, is a, essentially a new experiment. They had a demonstrator running and collecting data, and they're going to install uh, essentially two detectors now um, for run three. They will target this type of signatures, this type of phase space. So charging, essentially looking for milli charge particles, which are not reachable by other detectors. And what is really interesting about this detector is that their simulation is, of course, being verified, if you want, validated by a demonstrator running beforehand. This is quite unique, actually, but very, very solid grounds. Okay, and I conclude with Medal. Okay, we all know about Medal and all their success. Medal is essentially running uh, on top of the LACB uh, detector. Uh, what I want to, to, to highlight here is that uh, the installation of what they call MAP, the Medal apparatus for penetrating particles, will allow Medal to uh, um, essentially do interesting searches in RAN3 for extremely long um, uh, lifetimes. So again, extremely new things coming out of, of new experiments being built for RAN3. Uh, this brings me to my conclusion. Um, so I hope, I'm sorry for rushing this. I'm extremely sorry, but there is so much stuff I want to highlight and put in these slides that I had to do this. And what you see, I hope, from my talk, you, of course, you can't remember anything. One thing you have to remember, please, is just how much new things are coming out, either from existing experiments or experiments which uh, are, are, are built essentially for this type of searches. And a lot of the experiments uh, which are putting out new results are doing in a way now that theories are able, theorists are able to come and reinterpret these results. This is extremely, I think, nice. And it proves Michelangelo right when he wrote this, what I put here at the bottom in 2014, 14. he was saying the future will be essentially experimentally driven. And I hope at least for long-lived particles, I've shown you that this is in fact uh, uh, becoming a reality. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, excellent overview. And it's, uh, sorry about the timing. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, and once again, people should raise their hands uh, to be called on. I am in fact not seeing any questions yet. Uh, There's so much to digest. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So actually, I was going to, this is actually for both you and the previous speaker. So it's a question of, you know, how you can reuse these data. You commented that a lot of these data can be reanalyzed in terms of new, uh, new theoretical models. And is that, uh, can, can you perhaps do a, a brief comment on that strategy? Sure, sure. So uh, there are uh, multiple ways uh, that, that, that experiments can do this. Um, have data and Rivet are just two examples. But essentially, uh, I believe this was pioneered by the Atlas collaboration, by, by, by putting out as much as possible of the information that you have. And by trying also uh, to, so that's the first step, try to publish, for example, uh, on HEP data on Rivet, your uh, simulation, for example, or indeed access to, to as much as possible the data as it is as you have used. Of course, we must remember that there are big collaboration and there is a certain way of doing this. But this is the first step. The second step that I find very interesting and I think was pioneered by the Atlas experiment, but now you see also CMS and LACB doing this, is to actually design your study to be reinterpretable in the future. And this you can see, for example, with these nice, uh, nice searches for displaced dimuon signatures, which indeed, usually you can interpret these as dark photon signatures, but it doesn't have to be that way. And if you design your search to be reinterpretable by theorists, 
like, like CMS, LACD, and Antas are doing, uh, then this happens because there is interest about, uh, about these searches. I don't know what, what the other speaker can say. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think you covered most of the things is that we have already these things in place. And, you know, like I think sometimes, yeah, the experiments are not always perfect in providing all the information which is needed for theorists. And I think that we often get complaints about it when this doesn't happen. But, you know, like it is quite important because, you know, like, yes, uh, it's kind of sad if these results are only used for setting these few limits plots, which we have and aren't used for all the rest. So I uh, I mean, HEP data is like, you know, the obvious thing, which we use a lot of the time. Also publishing the likelihoods, I mean, you know, simplified or full likelihoods as we're doing lately. And so those things really help and will really also, you know, tighten our collaboration with the theory community. Yeah. What, what I might add, which just came to my mind is that actually what I saw uh, working well in our community uh, is the, this dedicated, uh, in this dedicated workshop, there is always, uh, a room or, or a session dedicated to reinterpretation. And there, essentially, you just listen to talks, then you forget, but you, then you go back and you have the names. A lot of the time, I've seen experimentalists and theorists uh, exchanging private emails, but the idea came from this, uh, from this dedicated workshop, which are, because lonely particles are, you know, are quite tailored if you want. So people tend to gather in this workshop. So, so this has worked. And, uh, and, and I must say also, uh, I mean, it's something that is nice to see happening because it's really, um, I really see the community speaking between theories and experimentalists, which is something that of course, not always uh, is, is happening, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, we have we have a couple of very short questions, and then we're going to have to go on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. I, I, data preservation is important, essentially. So, Darish. Hi. Yes, I have a question with regards to I believe it was slide eight in the platform slide eight, uh, comparing to the platform slide sixteen. So it was showing a comparison between the Higgs to two scalars, and I was just curious what the difference in the uh, production mode with this is in comparison to the one on slide 16, because the slide 16, I think it's, it's associated uh, vector Higgs. And so was just curious uh, if there's any, if this is comparable to the uh, plot on slide 16. Thanks. Okay, let me have a look on slide 16. Uh, yeah, okay. I don't think they're directly comparable. Um, the, 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 the type of signature, I, I believe, is different. Um, uh, now, on, sla on, on, on here, uh, you, you have a long leaf scale, a, a, a pair of long leaf scalar. OK, so the experimental signature is different. But yes, I see what you mean. Um, it, I think it's because um, yeah. it's four Bs on, on slide 16, whereas in, yeah. in CMS result, they decay to leptons, I believe. Yeah, so the experimental results is different. So here you have, an, uh, uh, yes, as Louis is saying, uh, four Bs, uh, while okay. here yeah, you, you, you don't have that. Okay. Yeah. I suggest uh, continuing this discussion in uh, the, the matter most, but Tanya also had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment to the previous uh, question um, before that one. So I'm not really part of this, but there's this LHC uh, New Physics Reinterpretation Forum, which has been, you know, studying this recasting of experimental signatures now for quite some time, so five, six years, and they are regularly publishing recommendations. I think the last one is from last uh, December or November. And <clears throat> sorry, they have a dedicated uh, Twiki. So honestly, anyone who's interested in this topic, I recommend to, to look at this Twiki. And um, I can also put it in the MetaMost. <clears throat> I'm just saying this because okay, this topic great. comes up again. Yeah, so yeah, okay. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. I'm from neutrinos, so I'm, I'm not always in on this. So, okay, so our last speaker, uh, is Pratik Agrawal from the University of Oxford, who's going to do our theoretical interpretation and hopefully not complain about the data. <laughs> uh, can you hear me okay? <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Uh, try to share my screen.
Okay, does that look okay? Yes. Okay, good. And you can see my pointer and the slide progression is fine. Okay, great. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I know it's been a long day of physics and I'm standing between many people and their food in many time zones. So I'll try to keep it light and brief. Uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers for putting together this conference in this very uh, challenging times. I was given the task of doing a BSM theory overview, which is a formidable task uh, to do in 30 minutes. So I'll, um, I'll try to be very general initially and then uh, pick up a specific thing that's more related to stuff I've been interested in, in the past uh, couple of years. So hopefully everybody will be equally unhappy uh, with that arrangement. Uh, so I would like to start with this excerpt from an introduction to a paper by Andre Losev, which I found uh, quite inspirational. Uh, during the last 40 years, theoretical physics has changed considerably. In the good old days, theoretizing was like sailing between islands of experimental evidence, and sailors were continuously looking forward, hoping to see land. Nowadays, some theoretical physicists found a way to survive and navigate in the open sea. Instead of the horizon, they look at the stars, which tell them exactly where they are. And so the maps that we make uh, look something like this. Federico was showing a version of this map, perhaps less cartoony in his talk as well, uh, where in the, most of the plots that you'd see in particle physics look like this, where there's some sort of energy scale on the x-axis and some sort of coupling on the y-axis. And instead of latitudes and longitudes, these are the maps, uh, this is the axis that we populate. And we have this continent of the standard model that we've discovered and some experimental, uh, probes that have covered some regions to, uh, uh, so far, but we would like to progress forward. And there's evidences from the standard model itself that uh, tell us where we might find new physics. Uh, but the one feature that I would like to highlight in my talk today is that there are unexpected sources of uh, guidance. There's new guidelines that we're finding uh, from, uh, not from the traditional sources. And so that's, that's the analogy with the previous uh, comment of looking at stars and finding new information. Uh, so where, where we are now, uh, the first two decades of the century, we were uh, anticipating this vast amount of data that uh, the LHC and their detection experiments and cosmology experiments are going to provide to us. So a lot of the theory effort uh, and BSM model building was directed into trying to be in the frame of mind of what to do with this data when it comes and how to interpret it when it comes, how we, would we fit our favorite physics models uh, in the context of these experiments. Uh, and this program has really matured as we can see from many talks in this, uh, uh, in this conference. Um, and it's an exciting program with very strong interactions between theory and experiment. Uh, and so, uh, so we now we have this uh, framework of simplified models or standard model effective field theory uh, or Higgs effective field theory, where we use to interpret vast arrays of models, not the single models by themselves. And in fact, in, even in these situations, there's deep open questions still being explored. For example, the relationship between the SMEFT and HEFT and uh, the geometric interpretation of HEFT are just theoretical developments of this effective field theory, which are still being explored uh, recently. Um, and, uh, and so this is a very mature and exciting field and experiment is, as also Federico was saying in his uh, talk previously, probably going to be leading the way that uh, theorists and experimentalists alike are thinking about uh, where new information could come from, new experimental targets, new colliders, uh, new design for low mass theory detection experiments or new precision frontiers. So there's going to be an exciting time where we're trying to figure out new experimental ideas. Uh, but given that this, aspect of the field has matured uh, in the last two, last two decades or so, it might be worthwhile taking a step back and to sort of evaluate what we've learned. Uh, and so to take a very big step back, in the last 50 years or so, we've really established quantum field theory. So we've really, we're really sure that quantum field theory works and any new physics that we're going to find in the foreseeable future is going to be interpreted in, the, in a quantum field theory framework. And so it bears to remember that quantum field theory is extremely restrictive, that when we put quantum mechanics and special relativity together, then the ingredients are very restrictive. For example, we're only allowed one uh, massless spin two particle, which is the graviton, and spin one massless states are expected to be part of a gauge theory, massive spin one 
uh, states are either in a tower or undergo Higgs mechanism. And so this basically fixes the ingredients that we've seen so far. And what's interesting is that the standard model actually utilizes each of these options, almost all of the options that quantum field theory allows. So we have spin zero, spin half particles. We have spin one particles, but they participate in gauge interactions. We have the spin two graviton, of course. So the only thing we haven't seen yet is a spin three halves gravitino. But other than that, the standard model actually utilizes all of these options available. Um, and so these ingredients are fixed on super general grounds of just quantum mechanics and relativity. Uh, and uh, the question is, what is the actual menu? Well, how does the standard model put uh, these things together? And, and trying to look at the patterns of the standard model, again, from some, some, from some distance, tells us already where we might look for new physics. So for example, the first thing we notice is, of course, the gauge interactions. And we notice that the gauge interactions are all, uh, all order one. They're not quite equal, but they're sort of similar in, similar in, uh, in magnitude. And so that tells us that uh, perhaps there is a there's a common origin to all these gauge interactions. So that motivates the idea of grand unification that perhaps all gauge interactions that look different from our point of view at low energies actually come from one single gauge interactions in the UV. Of course, to give the W bosons mass and to break electronic symmetry uh, and so on, we need the Higgs, which, we, which uh, almost uh, 10 years ago we discovered as uh, uh, the elementary excitation of. And so uh, as far as we can tell, it's an elementary scalar, which is extremely, uh, uh, which is extremely surprising. We haven't seen any other elementary scalar and that immediately leads to uh, the famous hierarchy problem where uh, we would like to understand what stabilizes the weak scale. What, why is the weak scale where it is? And uh, the typical solutions go uh, indicate new physics close by to the weak scale. And so there's a whole program of looking for uh, new physics at the weak scale uh, in, 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 at the LHC and in high energy colliders. Uh, once we add the Higgs, we also get uh, uh, Yukawa couplings of the Higgs with uh, quartz and leptons. Uh, the Yukawa couplings are a bit different from the gauge interactions, of course. They're hierarchical. They're not all order one. And there's this family duplication, and there's some hierarchy. So there's some, there seems to be some kind of pattern to Yukawa couplings, which is not quite, um, it, it's not quite apparent, but we, there is, it's also not completely random and generic. And so this gives rise to the whole field of flavor physics, where we try to understand these patterns. We try to constrain these patterns. Uh, and uh, uh, and so there's already been good great discussions on this uh, in lepton and quark flavor by talks by Danny and Aida, um, and so th this is this is something that gives rise to a rich phenomenology. Um, gauge theory also comes with these topological angles called theta angles, uh, which gives rise to the strong CP problem, which we would have more to say about uh, in a couple of slides. And of course, the dragons here are uh, is is quantum gravity. Uh, where there's no problem in incorporating gravity, uh, quantum gravity at low energies uh, as part of the effective theory of the standard model, we would like to understand what happens to gravity at high, at high energies. And, uh, and while we have some, in, some intelligent guesses for that, it's, uh, it's very far from, direct, uh, from our direct probes of to understand what really happens to quantum gravity. So from far away, this is sort of the view of the standard model that we, of course, all of us are very familiar with, but Perhaps that now that we have so much data, it's worth revisiting these uh, problems from a, a bit far away and, and, and identifying the fact that uh, even though we're making amazing progress, there's these big problems uh, of understanding the patterns of the standard model, which are still open and we would still like to understand them and make some progress on them. Um, apart from the Lagrangian, we also have, um, we also uh, have to understand with the state of the universe that we live in. Um, so if we make the energy budget of the universe, we find that the matter, uh, the matter that was described by the Lagrangian in the previous slide is only 5% of the total energy budget of the universe. And often people sort of use this to say, um, oh, that we, only, we don't understand very much, we only understand 5% of the universe. But I think what I find more surprising is this fact that if you actually go to the early universe, then this N effective constraint tells you that the standard model degrees of freedom completely dominate uh, which is quite surprising. I, 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 don't quite, I don't find it surprising to see that we are not quite dominant uh, in the energy budget of the universe, which I, but it, it is true in the early universe, uh, which, is, which is an interesting fact. Um, the early universe, which had electroweak symmetry restored, the quarks and gluons were deconfined. So this was not a hospitable place for us. So, to, so it's, an important, uh, it's important to understand our history, to understand how we got from this early universe phase 
through various phase transitions to the phase that we live in today, the metastable visitor like phase with uh, liquid water and QCD confined and everything uh, hospitable for life. How baryons came to be to dominate over antibaryons and things like that. And gravitational waves now are a probe uh, that give us a window towards probing this very early universe uh, cosmology and uh, specifically these phase transitions. Um, if we live in a metastable universe, are there other phases to worry about? Can we just tunnel into a different vacuum? And uh, uh, that would obviously be catastrophic for, for life as we know it. Uh, we would also like to understand, are there other defects, black holes, whether astrophysical or primordial, or other topological defects like domain walls or cosmic strings or magnetic monopoles that populate our universe today and uh, form part of uh, the state we live in? And then the understanding these would give right would be important for the from the point of view of phenomenology and what we can see and what signals of new physics we can see uh, so there's so there's an ever increasing synergy between particle physics cosmology and astrophysics where um, what new physics we will see and the lagrangian of particle physics often gets manifested also in the sense of, in the in the cosmology and astrophysics of the state that we live in Good. So, um, so that was that was my lightning bird's eye view of uh, these problems and the general problems in the standard model that we would like to address. And uh, I would like to talk slightly more concretely about these problems through the lens of uh, axion physics. So, axions are these uh, axions are these very light particles, and they're kind of like the tail that wags the dog, where you can see that even though these are very light particles, they have um, they have a lot to say about these problems that I talked about. So in this next part, I will touch upon many aspects of these general problems that, uh, that arise in the standard model, but through the, looking through the lens of axion physics. So, um, so the, the most canonical and familiar example of the axion uh, is the QCD axion. And this is one of the most compelling candidates for new physics. Um, the, the thing that motivates it directly is the strong CP problem, which very quickly stated uh, looks as following, that if we write down the Lagrangian of the standard model, uh, then we find that there are two uh, CP violating phases. And here's a way to parameterize them invariantly. There's these two phases that involve the Yukawa matrices. And we've measured one of the phases to be order one and constrained the other phase to be order 10 to the minus 10, even though they both involve uh, these Yukawa couplings in this intimate way. And so this is the strong CP problem. Why is one of these angles so much smaller than the other? And the axion was invented to solve precisely this, this problem where uh, this theta parameter, this topological parameter in the standard model is made dynamical. And so the axion A here couples to, the, couples to gluons through this uh, topological coupling. And, uh, and by general theorem by Waffa and Witten, it's guaranteed that, the, that QCD effects uh, generate a potential for this dynamical field at which minimizes it at theta bar equals zero. So this dynamically solves the problem by, uh, by making uh, zero the preferred place uh, for, the, uh, for the axion to live in. And in fact, in cosmology, we don't just slide down to zero smoothly. Uh, you slide down and then at some point you start oscillating about the minimum uh, with an ever decreasing amplitude. And so these oscillations of a coherent field about its minimum behave like matter, it clumps, uh, it redshifts like a matter. And so this is an excellent dark matter candidate, candidate as well. So this is why axions are very compelling. QCD axions are very compelling because uh, in one ele elegant mechanism, you solve two problems in the standard model, strong CP as well as dark matter. And if you ask for the QCD axion to solve these two problems, then there's a very narrow target parameter space that you, and, that you come up with. So here's one of these energy coupling kind of plots where the mass of the axion is on the x-axis and the coupling of axion to photons is on the y-axis. And there's a, very, very, there's a variety of experiments in the shaded colored regions which are probing this uh, preferred point I've indicated with a star. Uh, and there are many experiments planned that, have, uh, that, that are shown or proposed that are shown with uh, uh, colored lines here. And so we see that there is at least uh, the canonical model predicts a very narrow target space, uh, which is experimentally exciting because there's many experiments targeting it. So we might ask, is this, um, is this canonical expectation uh, fixed or are there compelling, uh, uh, compelling models that take us away from this uh, fixed points? 
Uh, thanks, Heidi. So indeed, there are actually, there's, a, there's, a, there's a large amount of uh, recent work uh, that uh, in, uncovers many mechanisms in quantum field theory and cosmology that actually take us away from this preferred point. And I've, I've included a partial list of references here. These are certainly not comprehensive. Uh, but one might have thought that the axion was, was postulated in the 70s and it's been 40 years where people have been thinking about the QCD axion. So really what new theory could there be to do in, uh, in, in 2020? But we actually see that there's a large amount of theoretical model building effort that actually is, has direct implications for uh, the phenomenology of axions that is still ongoing. Um, the axions also have a very interesting interplay with geometry. So beyond the QCD axion, in, uh, uh, in theories which have extra dimensions, for example, uh, string theory or any other new physics theory with extra dimensions, axions arise naturally. Um, so here by axions, we just mean some, uh, some particle which is protected by an approximate shift symmetry uh, as, as follows. Uh, and so this, this is how this kind of uh, axion arises in these extra dimensional theories. So let's take a toy example to understand this. Uh, let's take a five dimensional theory where the fifth dimensional is compactified on a circle of radius R5 uh, as shown in the by the cylinder on this figure. So if you have a gauge field, a U1 gauge field, uh, from the 4D point of view, it breaks up into a 4D gauge field and a, a pseudoscalar. And the pseudoscalar is nothing but this axion where the gauge symmetry in 5D becomes a shift symmetry uh, in, in from the 4D point of view. So wherever, whenever we have these compactified extra dimensions and gauge fields, uh, we get an large, we get axions uh, uh, generically. And so if you think about the string theory, about string theories or theories of extra dimensions, which have large number of cycles uh, and gauge fields running in the extra dimension, then we generically get a large number of axions from such constructions. Uh, and it, it can be shown on quite general grounds that uh, often the, uh, these axions are essentially massless. So people have done, for example, a study of databases of string compactifications in this paper, and they find hundreds of axions, um, some of them essentially massless. The, the exponential mass is smaller than the Hubble scale today, so they're basically massless from all phenomenological point of view. So there might be these very, very light massless particles running around that we might be able to uh, detect that actually tell us directly some information uh, uh, about uh, geometry and string compactification, which is, which is quite exciting. So uh, here's, here's one such example. Um, such the axions that I described can actually uh, form axion strings. So axion strings are these cosmic strings, which could be in the sky today, for example, somewhere in the sky, there could be a string going past, which is an axion string. And the interesting feature of this axion string is that photons, so this blue, uh, this blue uh, trajectory here is a, is a trajectory of a photon going around this axion string. These photons going around the axion string pick up a, pick up a Aranov bohm type phase. So um, um, if you take a photon uh, traveling around the axion string, there's an extra phase, this delta phi that it picks up. This delta phi is, uh, is proportional to this quantity A, where A is just parameterizing the coupling of the axion to photons. Um, so measuring this delta phi would just give us access to measuring A directly. Um, and the, the special thing about this quantity A is the way I've normalized it by taking out the fine structure constant and F and so on, this A is actually an integer or at least it's quantized in units of fundamental quantum of charge. So if electron was the fundamental quantum of charge, A would be an integer. If the up quark has a fundamental quantum of charge, A would be one ninth times an integer and so on. And so if you can measure this delta phi, this, which is just this phase that the photon picks up going around this uh, axion string, we'd actually be able to measure this fundamental quantum of charge directly, some, this quantity that is quantized. And um, here I've shown a simulation of uh, an axion string network. So these straight lines are essentially axion strings. Uh, on the sky. So this is just a zoom in picture of some latitude and longitude of the sky. And uh, this and the colors are showing the polarization of CMB photons passing through this, uh, through, through this string network. And you see that as uh, th this panel above, sorry, this panel above is actually showing the polarization rotation along this white strip. 
So this is just showing you how what the polarization of photons is as, as you go along the strip. And you see that as, as we cross uh, uh, an axion string, this polarization jumps. And in, this, in these units, it jumps by, by one. And it always jumps by, uh, by this quantized amount one because the, the jump in the polarization is exactly this extra phase you build up by going around the axion string loop. So, so there, there's observables in cosmology that give us direct access uh, to measure the fundamental unit of charge just by these, these axion-like particles. Uh, axions can, in a similar fashion, also have interesting interplay uh, with brand unification, where these coupling, this coupling that I uh, showed you before uh, is quantized. And it's quantized, so uh, it, has, it is unpolluted by renormalization or intervening phys physics. Uh, thanks, Heidi. Um, so, so because it's a quantized coupling, it's unpolluted, and it's unpolluted by sort of whatever is happening be between the low energy scale and high energy scale. It gives us a direct handle uh, to access UV physics by just studying the low energy couplings of the axion. So, if we discover the QCD axion, for example, it would be amazing, of course, to discover, say, a dark matter candidate and a new particle. But also, it would be very, very, very interesting to measure it coupling because it will tell us the information about the entire UV spectrum of charged particles potentially uh, just by measuring that one coupling. And so, so, so this fact that the axon couplings to gauge bosons are quantized is, is, very, is, a, is a very fortunate thing for us that we, get, that we get access to this UV physics just from studying low energy physics in the axions. And so, for example, if the, axion, if the standard model lives in a simple four-dimensional gut, then any axion-like particle that we see cannot be massless. It actually picks up mass from gut gauge bosons, not unlike uh, the fact that charged pions pick up mass from, uh, from the photon. Um, and, and one can study this in interesting generalizations, like if, the, if, the, if it's not a 4D gut, but a high dimensional gut, then how, what are the restrictions? And if the axions are not just 4D particles, but they're again, string theory, uh, stringy axion-like particles I was describing, then what do these restrictions look like? So this is ongoing work that I'm doing with my student, uh, Michael Lee and a postdoc at Oxford, Mario Rhee. Um, uh, and again, this is again the uh, I wanted to mention it because it's within the theme of the ideas that um, while we know that we, we should look for proton decay and we should look for these features of this, uh, we should maybe look for supersymmetric particles so for for grand unification. But there's other unexpected avenues that can give us information about this about new physics that we would that we haven't uh, um, that we haven't yet maybe thought about. Okay, so as I was as I expected, I'm running out of time. So I, um, let me just say the title rather than actually go give you any details. In this theme of finding uh, new guiding principles and new new guidelines, uh, a new uh, one, one of the new exciting uh, themes that has emerged is the so-called Swampland program, where um, uh, where the idea is 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 uh, in some sense. Um, inspired by the original dream of string theory, that there's one unique theory that will that will just predict everything, and then we'll be able to just predict from first principles all the things that we observe. Uh, and this idea that mathematical consistency restricts possible physics is quite powerful. In fact, we just look we just looked at an example early in the talk where quantum mechanics and special relativity, when we put them together, gives us a very restrictive set of options. So it's it's reasonable. It was reasonable to think that maybe when you put quantum gravity on top, then you'll get even more restrictions, but but the apparent large number of solutions of the string landscape undercut this this uh, this hope that we might be able to drop uh, very precise predictions from string theory. So swamp line in some sense a minor a minor uh, resurrection of this dream to say well there is a large number of solutions but not everything goes. There are some restrictions that we can derive uh, which are not apparent from the effective field theory point of view. They are just apparent from consistency of quantum gravity. Um, and so this is like this looking at stars and, and extracting, uh, extracting new information just by looking at stars and not just from what we see in effective field theory. Um, we, it, it's still, it, it's still, we're looking at stars and we're still trying to figure out whether, um, how concrete this program is. So we still have to figure out whether how much of this is astrology and how much of this is astronomy, but still there's a, there's a new qualitative bit of information that uh, hopefully we'd be able to come, come up with some robust and concrete set of, uh, restrictions that, that would be completely free information uh, that will tell us more about uh, phenomenology. So that's, that's, the, that's the hope of the Swampland program. Um, and 
I also had another infomercial about phase transitions, but since I only have one minute, let me not let me just leave it here for you to read uh, um, uh, on uh, new ideas on phase transitions and go to my conclusions. So rather than an overview, I would say this was just my current view on uh, what BSM theory is exciting right now. And uh, as I mentioned, the phenomenology at LHC and data detection experiments is an exciting and uh, really productive mature science. Uh, and we're, we're, I've been having a lot of fun uh, learning about all these new results uh, uh, in the conference so far. But there's still basic big picture questions in the standard model that remain or like the hierarchy problem have become more acute. And uh, there's a larger and larger synergy between particles and cosmology and astrophysics that we're seeing. Uh, and we're seeing new guiding principles emerging, like consistency of embedding theories in quantum gravity, new kinds of symmetry, new mechanisms, quantum field theory, and so on. Uh, so I'm really excited to find out where all of this leads. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, this overview. I realize it was hard to do it in 25 minutes. Uh, <laughs> do people have, yeah, very hard. Do, okay, so we have some questions. Alexei Petrov is first with a question. Hey, Pratik, nice to see you. Very uh, nice. Hey, Alexei, good to see you. Yeah, uh, so I have a question about your axions. I mean, some low mass axions usually have this quality problem. Um, so can you comment on that and uh, uh, sure. what the constraints on higher mass axions uh, are currently available? Uh, I don't know if you see my screen still or it exited. No. You don't. Let me try it again, sorry. Right, uh, right. Thanks for the question. I Yeah, so, so there is a so-called quality problem, which um, which is tied to some of these issues that I was very briefly alluding to. One of them being that this uh, the the protect the act the, the thing that protects axion from being uh, from getting a mass is the shift symmetry, which is a global symmetry. And so then um, uh, there's various arguments that these global symmetries cannot be exact and they're only approximate. And so you worry about the fact that uh, there might be quantum gravity um, corrections. To light axions, and so then, um, if you so if you just sort of naively start writing down operators, the first operator you should write down. Uh, uh, people usually start with dimension five, but I think you should just write down dimension two operator. You should just write down m Planck squared a squared operator, and say that look, there's you should not expect light axions at all. If there's no symmetry protecting it, then it should be Planck scale. Uh, but then, if you say, well, okay, maybe there's a higher dimension operator that 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 breaks the symmetry, then which what dimension operator do you need? And then the answer is some 12, dimension 12 or dimension 13 operator, which sounds a little crazy. Although you can sort of maybe engineer that by discrete symmetries. Um, when suppressed by Planck scale physics. So a higher dimension operator that breaks this shift symmetry uh, at Planck scale should be order dimension 12 or dimension 13, if I, if I remember correctly. This construction that I just told you is, is the construction which is uh, a geometrical way to undercut that expectation. So notice that in this extra dimension, this theory is a gauge theory. So there's no global symmetries. So there's no there's no there's no explicit breaking of gauge gauge symmetry or anything. And these the mass uh, the mass that you pick up in these theories is naturally exponentially small. And we can talk about maybe uh, there's a, there's a story why it's exponentially small, but I'm, I suspect you know this already. So 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 either you say well there's some some discrete symmetry mechanism that's operative, that's a bit Baroque, that's protecting the axion to dimension 12 or higher. And so that, that's why it doesn't have a, uh, have a uh, th that's why the QCD axion doesn't pick up a big symmetry breaking mass and induce a big theta bar. Or you say that it's an axion which comes from geometry in some sense, uh, in this sense. And then it has an exponentially good protection of its, uh, of its, uh, of its potential from quantum gravity effects. And so then, then it then it's a much cleaner uh, solution to the quality problem. Is that does that answer your question, Alexi? Oh, for that, yes. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Darius has a has a question. Yes. Thank you for, very much for the talk. My question might be a little bit broad, but I just was uh, wondering what your perspective is. Is the main problem with the current state of theory because you're saying that it's right now we're more experiment driven instead of theory driven? Is the issue that the experiments are 
are not able to keep up with, uh, sorry, no, that the theories are beyond the current experimental capabilities, or is it that the theories themselves are harder to falsify given that they have a much broader range of solutions so that if you say a certain range of masses, let's say if a, a, a hypothesized particle aren't found in data, you just say, oh, well, it might be this range instead. Is that, or which would you say is more of the issue? No, but I, but no, I, think, I think it's just, so first of all, I won't, I wouldn't, uh, hopefully I didn't give an impression that I characterize that as a problem. I think being driven by experiment is, I am driven by experiment. I, you know, look at data and then you decide where to go because uh, it, I, I think it's a fine thing to be driven by experiment. I, I don't think of that as a problem. I think there's an aspect of theory, which is, um, which is very strongly intertwined with experiment where, where if you have, so I, I don't know, as a, to pick up an example off the top of my head, if let's say you have two theories, one of which, which you equally love uh, in some sense. And then one of them is has new physics at the TV and one of them has new physics at a hundred TV. Um, if you were like me, if you were working in the last 20, last 15 years in the field, you would work on the theory with one TV. You want to understand its implications because information for that is forthcoming in this decade. So, so somehow the immediacy of data has, uh, has focused us on theories which are more close to experiment. And then that also tells you that what experiment can do also informs the, what what theorists are interested in from on, in that aspect of theory. But I, so it, it is. I think it's just one aspect of what what theory and where theory and experiment are working together. I, I, I don't see that as negative or positive. It's just I think it's a bin of uh, what what things are which things are going on, which is, which is an exciting bin, of course. I mean that's where that's where all the glory is, right? If you pre, if you predict a particle and it's found in the next ten years, that's where you will want to be. In some sense, so um, yeah. So I don't know if that answers your your, your question. Yeah, I, I think that uh, mainly answers my question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, well, uh, let's see. I'm checking the chat here. Uh, yes, I I would just like to say uh, thank you to all of the speakers in this session for a uh, fascinating and very broad ranging session. And I would like to wish all of the Europeans a happy happy uh, dinner and all of the people in Eastern Asia, uh, some well-deserved rest and the people in the US a good lunch. And see everybody tomorrow. Thanks very much to you, Heidi, Thanks. for sharing. And to you, bye. Thanks. See you tomorrow.